Our dear Heavenly Father, we, we come thanking you so much for today and for your care, for your blessings. Father, we want to, as you have instructed, to strengthen the brethren. And today I pray that you will help as we are each one in a battle, a battle for our lives. And I pray that we will be strengthened and encouraged to draw close and to live surrendered. In Jesus' name, amen. Our study title today is Trouble Cometh, Fear Not, Take Courage. Trouble Cometh, Fear Not, Take Courage. Let's go to our Bibles. Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 8. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 8. And it says, The righteous is delivered out of trouble, and the wicked cometh in his stead. The righteous is delivered out of trouble. But you know, it seems like that the majority of us get discouraged. The devil says, Ooh, look at that. Look at what you're doing. It's you're you're just you're failing. You can't be saved. There's no salvation for you. And then we begin to doubt whether or not we can have eternal life. But eternal life is a promise with conditions, of course. So I want to share with you a text message that we received this week. And this literally, I believe, to be the case of each one of us. Yet few of us will come to the admission that is here given. Years ago, this is the text message. Years ago, I perceived sin to be a spiritual condition that affected the total person, not just acts performed or habits that needed to be changed. Sin came to be recognized as my desire to be recognized as more than I in truth am, just a body with desires for continued existence via eating and sex for reproduction. Asking God to help me send my sins beforehand to judgment has been answered by such a multitude of dreams in my sleep that recall past experiences not fit to be enunciated. I am thankful for a heavenly priest, not another fallen human, to whom confession would only compound problems. Thank you for your willingness to express the convictions that the Lord impresses upon you. I am seeing myself as a scumbag, and I shall be patient with the Lord's process to make me fit for heavenly companionship. And that last statement was really the key as to why I wanted to share this, because a lot of times we do see ourselves as the scumbags that we really are. And of course there are those who think that they have no sin and that they've obtained the opposite side of the spectrum. I think there's a quite a very good balance here. Because he, if he just says, I'm seeing myself as a scumbag, I would have seen an individual who was very discouraged. But here it says, and shall be patient with the Lord's process to make me fit. As we go on into our study about this, we're going to realize that it's God's process that we are going through that helps us make that change. 
Because, see, God truly is a God of love. And He wants us to love Him. 1 John 4, 8, 1 John 4, 8 says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. You see, God does care for His creatures that He has formed. He knows when that sparrow falls, or in the case of last evening, when the cat brought the sparrow into the house, partially wounded. By the way, that sparrow received some cayenne water and was placed back outside again. Might have a little lopsided flight because she was missing a few tail feathers, but um, quite a few. But the point is, God really does care for us. See, like a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Psalms 103, 13. And Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 20 says, That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto Him. Again, conditions. Let's kind of look at some of those. 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 14. 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 14. If ye will fear the Lord and serve Him and obey His voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. So we have to fear, we have to serve, we have to obey, we have to not rebel against the commandment, and then we can continue following the Lord. He is not designed that his creatures should be miserable. Of course, the devil would love to see us that way, wallowing in our trials. 1 Peter 3.14 says, But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their tear, neither be troubled. I don't know about any of you, but I believe that if you've even taken five minutes to look at what's going on out there in our world, whether it was via YouTube, TV, or driving to the local store to get a few supplies, you will have realized that there's a lot going on out there. And some things are enough to make us fearful. But we don't have to be fearful today. In fact, we should look just the opposite. How many of us are thankful? Have any of us duly considered how much we have to be thankful for? Now that's supposedly what Thanksgiving is all about, which is that part of it's usually overlooked. But we don't have to wait for one day out of a year that's been dubbed a holiday to be thankful. How many of us have a roof over our head today? How many of us have clothing? How many of us won't go hungry today? are not in prison. And let's take it a step further. How many of us have a Savior if we choose to be obedient to those commands? 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14 says, But, and if ye suffer, for righteousness' sake, 
Happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Happy are we if we are in the Lord. Have any of us duly considered how much we have to be thankful for? Psalms 100 verse 4 says, Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. And bless His name. Sing praises, in other words, to praise our Heavenly King. You know, if you are discouraged or having a hard day, singing can make all the difference. And I've shared this a few times before, but it comes to mind and I'm going to share it again because I'm sure some of you have not heard. It's been a long time since I've shared this. I worked in a convalescent center like, I don't know, 25 years ago, something like that. 28 years ago. And I had just read that when Jesus was a boy, he sang, and it often would encourage the entire area, the people around him in the town where he lived. And that we should be like him. So I got to work that morning. And I immediately, walking in the back door of that convalescent center, I knew something was up. Because people were, it wasn't the normal talk. It was hurrying there, hurrying there. The hallways were empty. And then I knew what the problem was. The administrator came out of a room and he was not happy. He was having a bad day and everybody was paying that was anywhere in the vicinity. So I quickly, quietly slipped into my office, which was right near where I was, and I looked around and I thought, oh no, the project that I have scheduled for this morning is to get some flooring put down in the hallway, not far from the front office that had been taken up because of a problem. Anyway. It's like, oh, is there anything else I can do? What can I do? Maybe there's something I could go on the roof for for a while until the administrator calms down. No, I've got to get this done. I can't, I can't wait. So I gathered my things and I went down the hallway. And the Lord brought to my memory what I had read a few days prior about singing. And I was like, oh, no, Lord, no, 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 not me. I can't sing. I can't carry a tune. This is not a good thing. Um, if I try to, oh, please, Lord, no, don't make me do this. If I sing, it's going to make things worse. Don't. And I was begging God, please, no. And literally, I'm on my hands and knees because I'm working on the floor. So you might say I was in an attitude of prayer, but I was really, really arguing with him about this. Finally, I began to whistle. Well, I still can't whistle on key today, but I began to whistle. And I don't know many songs. I think the first song I started whistling was Jesus Loves Me. And I whistled through one song, and it wasn't real loud, but I was whistling. Of course, it echoes all the way down those tile hallways. And I said, okay, Lord, this is a test. I'm putting you to it on this one. You're making me sing, whistle in the hallway in front of everybody. You're going to have to do something here. And he did. It was less than 10 minutes went by. And it is, I saw the administrator coming down the hall, and I thought, oh, here it comes. I'm about to get it for something. I didn't know what, but I was about to get it. I knew that. And he said, good morning, Mark. It's a beautiful day, isn't it? And I looked up in surprise and said, yes, sir, it is. 
I'm going to try to get this tile done quickly so we can get the hallways cleared. And he said, great, great, looks wonderful. He went a few more feet down the hallway past me, and a CNA happened to be coming out of the room, and he said, appreciate the hard work. You're doing a great job. And I turned around and I looked. I was like, there's been a change here. And it was all because, I believe, I began singing. It was only a whistle, there were no words or anything, but there was a change. By the way, that change didn't go away the entire day. And my reason for sharing that with you all is because if we are thankful and we praise God, our thankfulness, our praise affects others. That was really hard for me to be able to do that. Of course, now we have all of our smart devices, at least a lot of us do anyway. I think if I would have just turned on some music on my smartphone, which didn't exist then, it probably would have done the same thing. Thankful to God, blessing His name changes the spirit of people. Conversely, have you ever realized that like rock music actually creates anger and depression? We're bombarded with that every day. We need to start praising God more. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 16, and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. When we get discouraged, we need to remember that the mercies of the Lord are new every day, every morning, and that his faithfulness fail not. Lamentations 3.22 says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because His compassion fail not. If it wasn't for the mercy of the Lord, there would be no reason for even our existence. Do we acknowledge our dependence upon Him? Do we express our gratitude for all His favors? Or are we like the Israelites of old, still grumbling all the way through the day about having to do this or do that or the way this post person spoke to us? Maybe we're discouraged because of our own attitude. We often forget that every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. James 1.17 Many today experience needless unhappiness. We take our minds off of Jesus and we place them on our own self, which is self-idolatry. And we begin the pity party of how we feel. We magnify the small difficulties and we talk about the discouragements. When in reality, we are guilty of the greatest sin of needlessly repining over God's providences that He is using to help us to be refined. David said in Psalms 27 verse 14, 
wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. For all that we have and are, we are indebted to God. He has given us strength that we might be overcomers. We need to labor earnestly through that strength provided not to please ourselves or be self-exaltant, but to glorify our King. We should not allow our minds to be swayed from the allegiance to God. I believe part of our problem is today there are many self-proclaimed preachers who are really wolves in sheep's clothing, meaning that their message is not a message of truth. It may be a message of worldly hype. It's coming. It's coming. It's about to collapse. The banks are going to fall. I've got an informer. The banks are about to close. You better get all your money out. And all of this hype that begins to go on. The war is coming here to America. I know for sure that we're about to see civil war. What are we going to do about it if it does? By the way, on this thing of money, I just got to say this. Stop and think about it just for a moment. This is how ludicrous all of this is. Let's say that we get warning that the banks are going to collapse. And so we go and we take out our little bit of savings that we have. And we tuck it away safely at home. And the banks collapse. All of them. Done. Well, all that green stuff that we brought home might be usable for starting a fire, if we have a fireplace to do that in. But it will have no value because the banks are closed. And some say, oh, well, silver and gold is the way to go. Well, that's all nice if you've got it. But you know what? We don't need all of that hype. We don't need that. What we need is to not be discouraged and put into a state of fear by these wolves in sheep's clothing. Matthew 7, verse 15 gives us warning about this. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. Do you realize that's often why we get discouraged? Is because of the fact that we are listening to the wrong information. And so because of that wrong info, we get discouraged because... We cannot, well, I've got no money to take out of the bank. What am I going to do? And we begin to get worried instead of looking to the author and finisher of our faith, our king, instead of being an overcomer. Matthew 24, verse 11 says, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. In other words, there's going to be many of these people out there that are preaching a message that is not true. They're going to be running around setting their dates and doing all of their, um, saying all of their things and, and working the, the fear factor. Do you realize that fear, or stated another way, sensationalism is a fantastic money maker? I actually had an independent ministry tell me that an independent speaker, many, many years ago, back in the 90s, he actually stated, I've got to get another newsletter out because the donations are down. 
And I said, what good is the newsletter doing? He says, oh, it's all the sensationalism in the newsletter that causes people to dig deep in their pockets because of, and he goes on, but anyway, enough stated. It was a way to make money. And it works. It's very effective. By the way, if I ever do that, um, somebody please smack me. Because... I don't want to work off of the sensational or the fear factor. Through Christ we may and should be happy. We should acquire habits of self-control. Isaiah verse 41 or excuse me chapter 41 and verse 10 Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10 says fear thou not for I am with thee, that would be God is with us. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Do we have any reason to really be discouraged? I can say, yeah, only because if we are, it's because we're looking at ourselves instead of looking to God. Psalms 94.11 tells us, The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. And David said in Psalms 119.113, I hate vain thoughts, but thy law, do I love? Maybe we ought to meditate more upon the law of God. Review and Herald, April 21, 1885, paragraph 2. Review and Herald, April 21, 1885, paragraph 2 says, Our imagination was not given us to be allowed to run riot and have its own way without any effort at restraint and discipline. If the thoughts are wrong, the feelings will be wrong. And the thoughts and the feelings combined make up the moral character. Did you hear that? If the thoughts are wrong, the feelings will be wrong. Now listen carefully. And the thoughts and the feelings combined make up the moral character. You're making yourself discouraged. You're making a character of, of think about it. When somebody observes you and you're like, oh, it's just a bad day. Everything's against me. It just seems like nothing's going right. We ever had any of those days? Yeah, I can say that. I can say that. I've had those days. Do you realize that we're, by allowing ourselves to succumb to that, that we are changing our character? Time to look up because our redemption is drawing nigh. Let me go on with this quote. I'm going to reread this last sentence since it's so powerful, and then we'll continue with our quote in Review and Herald, April 21, 1885. If the thoughts are wrong, the feelings will be wrong, and the thoughts and the feelings combined make up the moral character. When we decide that as Christians we are not required to restrain our thoughts and feelings, we are brought under the influence of evil angels and invite their presence and their control. If we yield to our impressions and allow our thoughts to run in a channel of suspicion, doubt, and repining, we shall be unhappy and our lives will prove a failure. 
It's our choice. Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 21 says, Behold, the Lord thy God hath set the land before thee. Now, yes, this is talking about Israel, but don't we have a land set before us as Christians? A heavenly? Behold, the Lord thy God has set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath said unto thee, Fear not, neither be discouraged. It's time that we ceased just being in discouragement and that we cease from fear and we prepare to go and possess the land. Deuteronomy 31, verses 6 and 8. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not. Neither be dismayed. Review and Herald. April 21, 1885. Paragraph 6 and 7. This is Review and Herald, April 21, 1885. Paragraph 6 and 7. But while our kind Heavenly Father has given us so many things to promote our happiness, He has given us also blessings in disguise. He understands that the necessities of fallen man, he understands the necessities of fallen man, and while he has given us advantages on one hand, on the other there are inconveniences which are designed to stimulate us to use the ability he has given us. These develop patient industry, perseverance, and courage. There are evils which man may lessen, but can never remove. He is to overcome obstacles. That's us. We are to overcome obstacles and make his surroundings, instead of being molded by them, he has room to exercise his talents in bringing order and harmony out of confusion. In this work he may have divine aid if he will claim it. He is not left to the battle with temptations and trials in his own strength. Help has been laid upon one who is mighty. Jesus left the royal courts of heaven and suffered and died in a world degraded by sin, that he might teach man how to pass through the trials of life and overcome its temptations. Here is a pattern for us. Are we going to follow the pattern? Or are we going to continue with self-idolatry. Joshua chapter 10 and verse 25. Joshua chapter 10 and verse 25. And Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of a good courage. For thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. Do any of you have any enemies? I know we do. If you don't have any enemies, maybe it's because you're walking on the wrong road. But we don't 
have to fear or be dismayed or discouraged about it. We need to be strong and of a good courage because God is going to take care of it for us. Maybe not today, maybe not even tomorrow. It might be the means for us to perfect our character. We only have a little more time to perfect that character for eternity. We need to use that time very wisely. And instead of being in discouragement, we need to rise higher and we need to prepare for eternity. 1 Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. Now in original testimony number 26, original testimony number 26, Page 117, it states this. The purification of the people of God cannot be accomplished without their suffering. I'm going to read it again. I want you to catch this. The purification of the people of God cannot be accomplished without their, that is the people of God, without their suffering. God, here we go on with the, tri with the um, quote, God permits the fires of affliction to consume the dross, to separate the worthless from the valuable, and let the pure metal shine forth. He passes us from one fire to another, testing our true worth. If we cannot bear these trials, what will we do in the time of trouble? If prosperity or adversity discover falseness, pride or selfishness in our hearts, what shall we do when God tries every man's work as by fire and lays bare the secrets of all hearts? Now we're going to go on with this quote in just a moment, but I want to share something with you that for me makes this, what I've just read, even more powerful. And that is, my grandfather was a blacksmith. Now I'm talking an old-fashioned 1800s type of blacksmith, except he was in the 1900s as a blacksmith. And I was in his shop as a young boy, and he was working at what's called the forge. The forge is where there's a little pile of coal and a fan that runs under it, blowing air through that coal. And by the fan speed and how much coal, he creates the amount of heat for the fire. And he took his tongs, and he, he went, and he put a piece of steel into that fire and he turned the fan up high. And if I'd have been thinking about it, I would have pulled, I've got pictures of that forge where that happened. Someplace I might even have a picture of him working at that forge. Anyway, he heated that steel up and he worked it around and he turned it over and finally after what I thought was forever, he pulled it out of the fire and he looked at it. And he just stood there holding it, watching it. And I said, Grandpa, what are you doing? And he says, do you see that purple color there? With the, and of course, it's red, but there was some purple at the bottom. He says, you watch that. And I'm watching it. And it's moving slowly up. And then it stopped. And the red just began to 
kind of get darker and darker and go away. And he took that piece of steel and he threw it aside. And he went and he got another piece of steel. And he grabbed it with the tongs and he put it in the fire. And he did the same thing over again and he pulled it out and he watched it. And I'm watching it and that purple just continued to rise and rise and rise. And as it reached the top, he stuck it back in the fire again. And he heated it up again. He did not leave that piece of steel unattended. He was there with it. And he pulled it out and he stuck it into the, the cold water next to it. And he stuck it in real quick and pulled it out and he looked at it and he put it back in the fire. I don't know exactly what he was looking at. But this process went on. And he pulled it out and he stuck it in. He pulled it out. He looked at it and he stuck it back in the cold and then back in the cold. And then he just doused it hard in the cold and left it there. But he didn't leave it alone. He still had it in his tongs. And he held it there and he pulled it out and he looked at it and he said, this piece will do the job nicely. And he put it back into the fire again. And then he began to fashion it into what he was building. You see, the blacksmith was with that piece of steel. That represents us. We are that steel in the fire. He was watching for the impurities to be burned out of that piece of steel. And when it passed the test, he then heated it again so that it could begin to be fashioned. The hot, the cold, you tell me that's not a trial? Just come enjoy Melanie's fever treatments and you'll think it definitely is. Let's go back to our quote. Testimonies, original testimony number 26, page 117, paragraph 2. True grace is willing to be tried. That means we're willing to be put in the fire. Not complaining, but we're willing to go there. Because we know the smith is there with us. True grace is willing to be tried. If we are loathed to be searched by the Lord, our condition is serious indeed. God is a refiner and a purifier of souls. In the heat of the furnace, the dross is separated from true silver and gold of the Christian character. Jesus watches the test. He knows what is needed to purify the precious metal. Just like my grandfather knew whether to dip it once into the water or two or three times before putting it back into the fire. He knows just what to do. He knows what is needed to purify the precious metal that it may reflect the radiance of his precious love. God brings His people near Him by close testing trials, by showing them their own weakness and inability, by teaching them to lean upon Him that He is their only help and safeguard. Then His object is accomplished. They are prepared to be used in every emergency, to fill important positions of trust and to accomplish the grand purposes for which their powers were given them. God takes men upon trial. He proves them on the right hand and on the left. They are thus educated and trained and disciplined. Now on continuing on here, this is we're on to page 118, the third paragraph. God's work of refining and purifying must go on until His servants are so humbled, so dead to self. And all I could think of when I read this as I was putting this together is, I guess I'm not dead to self yet. Because if I were, I wouldn't 
feel the flame. How many of you are that way as well? Be honest. God's work of refining and purifying must go on until His servants are so humbled, so dead to self that when called into active service, their eyes are single to His glory. Then He will accept their efforts. They will not move rashly and from impulse. They will not rush on and imperil the Lord's cause. Being slaves to temptations and passions, followers of their own carnal minds, set on fire by Satan. Oh, how fearfully is the cause of God marred by man's perverse will and unsubdued temper. How much suffering he brings upon himself by following his own headstrong passions. God brings men over the ground again and again, increasing the pressure until a transformation of character and a perfect humility bring them into harmony with Christ, with the Spirit of Heaven, and they are victors over themselves. Wow. The trial intensifies until there's complete victory. So when we have trials, why should we be discouraged? God sees something in us worth testing and purifying. Therefore, we should be encouraged. 1 Chronicles 28, 20. And David said to Solomon his son, Be strong and of a good courage, and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee, until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. That's our promise. That is our promise. Matthew 10, 28 says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Only worry about those they're going to take you out spiritually to, cure the, to kill the soul. Review and Herald, May 3, 1892, paragraph 7. Review and Herald, May 3, 1892, paragraph 7. We are not to think that we can have an easy time. But what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Mark 8, 36. We shall have respect unto the recompense of the reward and esteem the reproaches of Christ greater riches than the treasures of this world. The fear of God should ever be before our eyes in all our business transactions, in all the concerns of life. Psalms 27, one of my favorite psalms. Psalms 27, verses 1 through 5. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Now before I go on to verse 2, we're going to go to Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13, which says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Fear God and keep His commandments, 
for this is the whole duty of man. Now let's go on to verse 2 of Psalms 27. When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came up upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. For in the time of trouble He shall hide me in His pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And going over to Psalms 145, verse 19, it says, He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. In Joshua 1.9, you see the scriptures are just full of counsel for us to encourage us, to not be discouraged, to not let our enemy gain the victory over us. Joshua 1.9, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage? Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. God is with us. Now if we can't go, or we go, I should say, where God does not approve of us going, and we, can, and we say falsely that, well, God's with me because He says He'll always be with me. But if we're going against his counsel, is he going to stay with us to go or to do what he says that we're not to do? No. Review and Herald, April 3, 1888. Review and Herald, April 3, 1888, paragraph 10. You are not to be discouraged or faint-hearted. The word was given to Joshua. Be strong and of a good courage, for there is a great work before you. And his success depended upon his obedience to God. When the tempter comes in to distract you, if your mind is filled with the scriptures, you will say, I cannot do this evil and sin against the Lord. Joseph was enabled to resist temptation because he made God his refuge. He exclaimed, How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He trusted in God, and his soul was protected. And this is the only safety for us. Skipping down a little bit. But there is no safety for you unless you understand what saith the scriptures and carry this out and weave it into your daily life and experience. Carry it with you wherever you go. Thus, you will be forfeited or fortified, thus you will be fortified against the delusions that are filling the world at the present time and will obtain the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as I read this, you will be fortified against the delusions. You remember I, just a moment ago I spoke about the wolf in sheep's clothing. It's like, how do you spot them? 
How can you spot them so quickly? Well, you know what? When you go through the trials and when you are obedient, you will begin to, as you begin to hear them speak, within a moment or two, you will go, no, God is not with this individual. For instance, I'll give you an example that just popped into my mind. We joined a conference call one time, quite a few years ago. And when I say joined, we went there to listen. We weren't part of it or doing it. We were just lis listeners, observers, like you are here today. And the man said, let's kneel and pray. Okay, that's good. And then his next words, he said, Father, we come to you in the holy place, for we desire bread off of the altar. And Melanie caught it. She reached up and she hit that button and disconnected. And she said, did you hear what he just said? And I said, yeah, I did. I heard. Did you hear what he said wrong? When I shared that, did any of you hear what was wrong? And why we wanted to be no longer connected with that. He is in a holy place worship where Jesus has left. Jesus, since 1844, no longer is in the holy place. Satan appears by the throne, which was the table of showbread. Meaning that this man's worship was before Satan. He may not have known it. By the way, we did talk with him tried to talk with him by email about it. No response was given, so we didn't just let it die. But we also didn't just continue on. My point is, as we draw closer, as we are purified, we will catch these things from these false sheep that are literally raving wolves. And we have to choose immediately our choice. And thus we will be fortified against the delusions that are filling the world at the present time. And then as we pass these tests discouragement will not come upon us as it has before. There will be trials. There will be trials until we are sealed with that seal of the living God. So we'll be continually put in the cold and the heat as the blacksmith does for testing and for purifying. Literally, my grandfather would use the heat to get the imperfections out of that steel so that it would be strong enough for the job that it was to do. That's profound. That is profound. When we're put in the fire, just like the three Hebrew worthies, remember Jesus is there with us in the fire. Are we willing to be purified? Or are we going to be fighting against it, against the purification process? Let us seek our Savior let us no longer be discouraged. Let us no longer waller in the mire. But let us come up higher.
so that we may be accounted worthy in the day of trial and test. Let's seek the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come desiring to be purified, to be victorious through the test and trial. Help us to be willing, grant us strength to overcome and to be victorious. Father, as we come, not worthy, we plead for that purifying process. I plead that we will no longer be discouraged and feeling forsaken, but that we will trust you, that you are purifying and refining us. Bless and guide us now through this Sabbath. And may your will be done in our lives. That we may be fit for that heavenly kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. to be like thee, full of compassion, loving, forgiving, tender and kind, up in the helpless, cheering the fainting, seeking the wandering sinner to find. Oh, to be Thank you.